All right, folks, I think we're going to get started. Thank you for, for your patience. I'm Mark Dubowitz, and I'm the chief executive here at FDD. And I'm, uh, thank you very much for joining us in this conversation about the crisis of compliance. And, and it's really an honor for me to introduce Assistant Secretary Pablete to all of you. Um, I'm going to then be moderating a panel with uh, hopefully some interesting insights and, and remarks after her speech. Before I introduce her, I want to thank, uh, first of you, for attending. Second, uh, to uh, please turn off your cell phones. Um, there's folks uh, watching live streaming and on C-SPAN. And we're going to be live tweeting this uh, at FDD. So FDD, for those of you who don't know us, we're a nonpartisan policy institute. We focus on national security and foreign policy. And the issue of, of nuclear weapons and, and chemical weapons has really been central to the work that we've done for over 15 years. So we're particularly uh, happy and grateful to be hosting this, this discussion. We, uh, let, me, let me actually introduce Elam because we've had uh, the pleasure at FDD of working with her over, over many years. She is uh, the, now the Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control, Verification, and Compliance. Uh, she was sworn in after a really incredible career in public service. She worked at the Department of State, the White House, spent two decades at the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, including as the, uh, the Chief of Staff there. And uh, we had, you know, again, the honor of working with her at HVAC on, on many of the issues that, that are dear and near to our hearts. Um, Dr. Pobletta worked really virtually every regional and functional issue. She spearheaded multiple legislative efforts across a range of foreign policy and national security priorities, um, but also with a, with a particular focus on counterproliferation to really hold violators and regimes accountable. Um, particularly rogue states such as Iran and North Korea and Syria. So we are grateful for her service to our country. And I know I sleep better at night knowing that she is the Assistant Secretary in such a critical position. So Ilem, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, as Mark was saying, I look around the room and I see so many friends, uh, former colleagues, uh, friendships that were built in the legislative trenches, so to speak, as we were working collaboratively to develop uh, legislative solutions uh, to the threats posed by these uh, pariah states. So. Today marks exactly three months uh, since my confirmation, and I cannot think of a better place and uh, a better environment to commemorate those, uh, those three months. So thank you for having me. I uh, thank you to uh, Toby as well, uh, Cliff, who's not in the room, but uh, thank you to Cliff and uh, just everyone at uh, FDD. Uh, again, I'm humbled by the opportunity to discuss uh, some of the challenges posed by these pariah states to the United States and other responsible nations, and to address their previous or current violations of their obligations under the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty or the Chemical Weapons Convention, as well as numerous UN Security Council resolutions. Iran continues to refuse to provide or acknowledge certain information regarding the military dimensions of its past nuclear activities. The Foundation for Defense of Democracies has been in the forefront of efforts to keep these issues before the American people and to support efforts by President Trump and his administration to confront and impose costs on both Iran and Syria for the totality of their malign activities. Before delving into some of the actions by these regimes, which constitute an unusual and extraordinary threat to US national security and to global peace and stability, I would like to share a few points of interest for this group about the history and mission of the Bureau that I am fortunate to lead. The Bureau of Arms Control, Verification and Compliance is one of only a handful at the Department of State mandated by Congress with specific statutory authorities, the chief of which is principal responsibility within the department for verification and compliance with arms control, nonproliferation, and disarmament agreements or politically binding commitments to which the United States is a party. 
The Congress expressly created a position of Assistant Secretary for Verification and Compliance, the statutory name of the position I currently hold, to elevate verification to the same level as any official responsible for regional affairs and to provide a specialist official within the Department of State in negotiations on arms agreements from the perspective of verifiability. We develop frameworks for inspection and verification and are required to evaluate the verifiability of any such accords and submit, submit such assessments to the chairman of the relevant committees of jurisdiction in the Congress. We have a cadre of policy and technical experts, physicists, chemists, biologists, seismologists, engineers, former missile commanders, and former international and U.S. inspectors, and they comb through information from a myriad of sources to arrive at determinations on verifiability and compliance, whether focused on chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons, their delivery systems, or something that is not well known, activities in outer space or under the sea, or any other new domains of potential warfare. ABC is also responsible for the preparation on behalf of the Secretary of State of what is known as the Compliance Report, the report on adherence to and compliance with arms control, nonproliferation, and disarmament agreements and commitments. In order to fulfill this mission, ABC was tasked as the principal policy community representative to the intelligence community on verification and compliance matters. Via our verification fund, the ABC Bureau is able to drive development of monitoring and detection technologies that can help enable a compliance or non-compliance determination. I can assure you, we take our mission extremely seriously and view it as integral to the implementation and to advancing the goals delineated in the national security strategy that was unveiled in December of last year. Now let's turn to Syria. Under the rubric of defending our nation against weapons of mass destruction, this national security strategy I just referenced notes how the Syrian regime's use of chemical weapons against its own citizens undermines international norms against these heinous weapons, which may encourage more actors to pursue and to use them. Both before and after becoming a party to the Chemical Weapons Convention, Syria has brazenly violated the international norm prohibiting the use of chemical agents as weapons, bringing a horror that blighted the onset of the 20th century into the current landscape. Responsible states have reacted to these violations using mechanisms provided for in the Chemical Weapons Convention, CWC, in particular to bring the Assad regime back into compliance. The United States was critical in ensuring the creation of a fact-finding mission of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, or OPCW, as well as a joint OPCW-United Nations Joint Investigative Mechanism, what is commonly referred to as the GIM. These bodies' investigations culminated in reports clearly establishing the Syrian Arab Republic was responsible for at least four <coughs> cases of chemical weapons use and that the so-called Islamic State was responsible for another two. After the Russian Federation vetoed the extension of the Jim's mandate in an effort to hide the Assad regime's crimes, we worked assiduously with other chemical weapons convention states parties to give the OPCW the authority to fulfill the Jim's old mission. We continued our efforts, and just last month, we were successful in ensuring that the UK-drafted, US-supported, 
and co-sponsored decision on attribution of chemical weapons use was adopted at a special conference of state parties at the OPCW. <coughs> but I would be remiss if I did not also note U.S. efforts outside of the OPCW to bring pressure on Damascus over its use of these heinous weapons. These include Treasury Department sanctions on key figures within the Syrian regime, the Department of State's efforts to impede the flow of key dual-use supplies to the CW program, and of course, U.S. military airstrikes. I also do not want to minimize the important role that our partners have played in the effort from the EU's long-standing dual-use export ban on Syria to France's international partnership against impunity and the French and British involvement in this past April's airstrikes. Now, Syria's blatant disregard for its international obligations, of course, is not limited to just the Chemical Weapons Convention. Syria also remains in continued non-compliance with the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, MPT, and its safeguards agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency as a result of its clandestine, clandestine efforts to construct al Kabar, an undeclared plutonium production reactor in eastern Syria. And for those of you who are familiar with the al Kabar facility, it was built with North Korean assistance. While the al Kabar reactor was destroyed by an Israeli airstrike in 2007, Syria has persistently refused to cooperate with the IEA's investigation and denied the agency's requests for information and access to address all outstanding questions regarding its activities at the site and other related sites. Syria's failure to cooperate with the IAEA remains a matter of ongoing concern indeed for all of us. Moreover, Syria's efforts to impede the IAEA's investigation illustrates the degree to which the Assad regime is prepared to go to conceal its clandestine nuclear activities. Rather than responding in good faith to the IEA request for information and access, Syria continues to go to great lengths to deceive, obfuscate, and distract international attention from its perennial noncompliance, and in many instances, with the assistance of the Russian Federation. The Trump administration has been clear that we cannot allow Syria's NPT and IAEA safeguards noncompliance to just merely fade into our collective memory. All, all outstanding questions regarding Syria's noncompliance must be resolved. Now clearly, the behavior of the Assad regime with respect to the Chemical Weapons Convention and the MPT presents a stark challenge to all other parties of this agreement, or at least those who remain in compliance with their own international obligations, other responsible actors, as well as a challenge to the role that these very agreements play in the maintenance of international peace and security. Within the region, the ongoing conflict by, fueled by Assad's determination to remain in power through any means necessary adds to instability that provides opportunities for even larger threats to develop. As I mentioned, the so-called Islamic State's use of chemical weapons in addition to other threats. Syria has provided an opportunity for its fellow rogue, Iran, to expand its influence in order to threaten the security of Israel and even other targets around the entire Mediterranean region. Turning to Iran and the JCPOA, 
The JCPOA agreement was flawed at multiple levels. First, I'd like to address the technical problems. It allows Iran to continue to conduct certain research and development activities on more efficient centrifuge machines that, if deployed on a larger scale, would significantly reduce the number required to produce highly enriched uranium and could make clandestine enrichment facilities more difficult to detect. It also does not provide irreversibility of limitations imposed on existing centrifuge equipment. For example, IR-1 centrifuges at Natanz, in excess of JCPOA limitations, are stored, not destroyed. Now, President Trump has underscored the dangers posed by the sunset provisions in the JCPOA. But technical examples include ending the limit on Iran's stockpile of uranium hexafluoride, enriched to 3.67%, installing infrastructure for the advanced IR-8 centrifuges at Natanz, and eventually ending containment and surveillance of centrifuge rotors and bellows, as well as ending the prohibition to operate additional heavy water reactors or accumulation of heavy water. The verification provisions of the JCPOA did not go far enough. Given Iran's history of clandestine nuclear activities and extensive sanitation campaigns, something one of our members of the audience knows extremely well, having been an IEA inspector. Uh, Iran's extensive sanitation campaigns to conceal the nature and scope of these efforts, once detected, effective verification in Iran requires an intrusive inspection regime that helps ensure the paramount objective of permanently denying Iran any pathway to nuclear weapons. The JCPOA at a political level creates the conditions under which Iran's noncompliance had been addressed prior to the negotiation and implementation of the JCPOA. These conditions have drastically been altered since the negotiation and implementation of this agreement. Unanswered questions about the possible military dimensions of Iran's past nuclear activities still loom large in our assessment of the potential threat that Iran represents. Playing on the other party's uh, evident desire to keep the JCPOA alive, Iran is now attempting to throw a scare into other JCPOA parties over continued compliance in order to prompt them to provide the economic benefits that Iran believes are due to the regime under the JCPOA. And most concerning of all, perhaps, as it relates to broader U.S. nonproliferation objectives, the JCPOA did not cover Iran's missile programs or its other WMD programs and activities. The JCPOA fails to prevent Iran from ever having fissile material production capabilities that would permit it to rapidly break out into weaponization. This, along with its failure to address Iran's aggressive misbehavior in the region, is why President Trump has described the JCPOA as a terrible deal. Iran asserts its perceived inalienable right under the MPT. But the MPT must be viewed in its entirety. One article of the MPT must be viewed in relation to other obligations under other articles of the MPT. Article 4 speaks of the state's party's rights to develop, research, production, and use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. But it connects that right 
to conformity with Articles 1 and 2 of the treaty. The safeguards described in Article 3 are also an explicit requirement for the demonstration and confirmation of the peaceful nature of a nuclear program. Iran has not yet demonstrated to the world that it has rectified its egregious record of noncompliance and deception and with Articles 2 and 3, which led the IEA Board of Governors to refer the Iran matter to the UN Security Council, and which led to the passage of 10 resolutions just between 2006 and 2014. Iran is also using the JCPOA to justify its renewed acquisition of equipment and materials, ostensibly for its peaceful nuclear program. And these materials have a dual use application. The recent disclosure by Israel of its discovery of thousands of documents preserved and in storage regarding Iran's past nuclear weapons program, including, according to recent press reports, plans for the design of a nuclear device, should leave no one in doubt that Iran has not yet clearly put its unlawful nuclear weapons ambitions forever behind it. ABC experts are monitoring these and other developments that would inform our assessments going forward on Iranian compliance with, the, again, the totality of its obligations. Now, looking ahead, President Trump has made it clear that we need to abandon the JCPOA mindset. But in withdrawing from this deal, the president also said, it is the policy of the United States that one, Iran be denied a nuclear weapon and intercontinental ballistic missiles. And he later said that the policy of the United States is to counter Iran's aggressive development of missiles and other asymmetric and conventional weapons capabilities. Secretary of State Pompeo has described how this policy will be pursued and has said President Trump is ready, willing, and able to negotiate a new deal. But the deal is not the objective. Our goal, the Trump administration's goal, is to protect the American people. And we will not renegotiate the JCPOA itself. Those are direct quotes from Secretary of State Pompeo. Any new agreement must address the full spectrum of threats to U.S. security and interests presented by Iranian noncompliance with its international obligations. It should verifiably and indefinitely deny Iran all paths to nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction. It should not just merely contain, control, or delay the regime's efforts. As such, it is incumbent for the U.S. in moving beyond the JCPOA to seek what is termed effective verification. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee report accompanying the legislation which created my position as Assistant Secretary for Verification and Compliance and the ensuing ABC Bureau stated that effective verification consists of a high level of assurance, in the United States' ability to detect a militarily significant violation in a timely fashion and should also, and this is, I, I must emphasize this because it has relevance to the JCPOA in Iran, its compliance, should also provide detection of patterns of marginal violations. I'd like to close with one observation. Nothing in the conduct of foreign policy is ever done in a vacuum. The end state that we must seek for the successful conclusion of any future deal with Iran must also inform and be informed by the end state we are seeking for North Korea. 
Inconsistency in our approach to either negotiation will undermine our credibility and most likely doom the prospects for successfully dealing with the threats to our security posed by these and other actors and the threats posed to, and to address the proliferation challenges of the future. Once again, I'd like to refer to the national security strategy. In it, the president states, the scourge of the world today is small group of rogue regimes that violate all principles of free and civilized states. In response to these threats, the strategy calls for the augmentation of measures to prevent the spread of and to eliminate WMD and related materials, their delivery systems and technologies. It further underscores the need to hold state and non-state actors accountable for the use of WMD. Accountability is critical for deterrence. To do so, we must be always vigilant, intensifying monitoring, detection, and verification of the activities of these pariahs, rogue regimes. Wishful thinking cannot substitute for such vigilance, and hope cannot be allowed to replace rigor. Noncompliance and blatant disregard of international norms must be dutifully and thoroughly reviewed, documented, and assessed. This is where the ABC Bureau's mandate comes into focus with the compliance report, among other tools, serving as a predicate for action and accountability. And I'd like to just say I am honored and humbled by the opportunity to work with ABC professionals in the service of our nation to ensure that this accountability will lead to the prevention of WMD <coughs> proliferation and to the elimination of the threats to our nation.